propose introductions. So, are we good, Tom? Great. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming out this evening. My name is Joshua Schwartz with the Mad River Valley Planning District. Tonight marks the fifth and final edition of the Mad River Valley Renewable Energy Series, exploring a broad range of issues related to the Valley's renewable energy potential. Um, this is hosted by the Mad River Valley Planning District, uh, as well as uh, VCAN, the Vermont Energy Climate Action Network. Uh, they provided uh, some grant assistance to um, underwrite uh, this project. These talks continue the dialogue of energy in the Mad River Valley by bringing together community members and energy professionals on a variety of topics. The four previous uh, of events uh, spoke to, uh, since September, spoke to local energy history and the framework for energy, energy local energy change, uh, solar, energy finance, and in the Vermont Energy Plan, and biomass. Uh, this evening's topic is conservation, weatherization, and efficiency. Um, our, our first presenter will be Richard Chaplinski. Um, we'll be talking about energy conservation. Um, uh, Richard uh, has been practicing living simply uh, for, for more than 35 years, um, has a home in Adamant, and, uh, and, and he had been uh, living this lifestyle while working at ANR in the Water Resources Division. Second, uh, we will hear about energy, actually, how, how did we do the order here? So you're going to go second? Great. Um, and Chris Badger who's an energy consultant with uh, VEIC, Vermont Energy Investment Corp, uh, as well as the Waitsfield Energy Coordinator, will be talking about a project, a small business energy outreach program uh, related to energy monitoring in the Mad River Valley. Um, Chris is 15 years in, in developing and deploying small and uh, megawatt uh, level solar and wind systems and programs related to energy efficiency. And then last, uh, we'll have take, tackling home energy efficiency, making a plan. Uh, the nuts and bolts of weatherization, Lori Fielder um, from Central Vermont Community Action Council, uh, who's a project manager working on the weatherization skill shops and a variety of other uh, pieces. Uh, the, the trailer that, that, that's uh, out front, which is shown in that picture there, uh, had an open house today, and both uh, Lori and Brad Cook uh, from Building Performance Services, our local home performance contractor here in the Matter River Valley, uh, the, the two of them led tours this afternoon, and they'll be sharing some of that material here today. Um, so each presenter will, will be taking between 20 and 30 minutes, and then uh, we will have time for questions and answers um, at the end. So without any further ado, uh, Richard? <coughs> Make it brighter or darker? Yeah, we usually do have spotlights. Thanks, Joshua, <clears throat> and hello, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. And um, I hope this talk will uh, give you a sort of a new perspective on energy conservation and motivate you to look into it a little more deeply. Um, first, I'd like to just get a show of hands if, um, if you've been taking steps on energy efficiency, like insulating, tightening your home, and so on. Yes, good. And how many have been <clears throat> uh, taking steps to conserve energy, which would be turning lights off, Traveling less, good. And then how many are actually keeping track of the energy output and how you're doing? Not quite so many. So it's a very important thing, and I'll try to get to that in the talk. So let's take a look at the big picture first. We've got global warming um, <clears throat> uh, happening faster than we, we, uh, we think it was going to happen. Nations of the world not getting together to do anything about it you start wondering if there's anything you can do um, <clears throat> to, to slow it or, or stop it. And um, the answer lies in what we can do personally and what we can do societally, because we can only do so much personally. It's a collective action. So I've had some fun um, looking into and doing some research uh, um, uh, in preparing this talk. And I ran across a Swiss effort that started about 10 years ago uh, called the 2000 Watt uh, society and before I put on a uh, <clears throat> PowerPoint image um, I've got to, to uh, just throw out a caveat um, I didn't delve into how this number came up uh, how it was uh, obtained and uh, if it was done ten, year, 10 years ago it's already outdated because the population has increased so as the population goes up 
the amount of energy that we can we are allowed to use per person in other words what's the energy we use and still keep a sustainable planet um, is uh, less and less as the population goes up that's a big problem and I'll get into that a little bit later <clears throat> Um, and then if you go on the web and have done your ecological footprint, you'll notice that um, uh, it doesn't come out the way you think. For example, the way I've lived for the last 33 years, um, <clears throat> I still would still require about we lived. All seven billion of us live that way. So it's and so there are a lot of things that you take, have to take into account. But let's uh, get the first slide. And uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is from, uh, from the uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, a model for energy policy, how it's possible to consume only as much energy worldwide as worldwide energy reserves permit, and which is, oh, sorry. Yeah, this is a problem. So <clears throat> it's from the Swiss um, um, Federal Institute of uh, Technology, and it's an energy policy, and it demonstrates how it's possible to consume only as much energy as worldwide energy reserves permit, and which is justifiable in terms of the impact on the environment, in other words, to keep a sustainable environment. And uh, <clears throat> it's possible if every society limits their energy consumption to a maximum of 200 watts, and that 200 watts is continuous power. I'm sorry, 2,000. That's continuous power. And uh, if I could have the next slide, next PowerPoint. Um, <clears throat> in terms of energy, each person requires 17,500 kilowatt hours of energy, or if you put that into converting it to continuous power, it's 2,000 watts. Now, where are we um, in this spectrum? Switzerland now uses 6,000 watts per person, continuous power. So they've needed a reduction of about 70, 67%. Rural China, 500, they can ramp up, they can double it. Uh, USA is 12,000, so we've been, we have need a reduction by 83%. The next one. So um, how are we doing? And I'm going to use two examples. Um, my home in Adamant where I've lived uh, for 33 years um, as simply as I can. There's a whole story about why I did this, but not time for it here. Um, and then um, I'm married to Kenny Perot, sitting here in the front, and uh, uh, my home is also in Warren, and I've done a um, ransom numbers for a home in Warren. So if you look, look at that, <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> the big items are transportation. Um, my home in Adamant, I have a truck. I use it for sawmilling, logging, firewood. I use this year so far, and I don't think I'll fill it up again this month, um, 253 gallons of gas. And that works out if you run the numbers, um, 9,000 some kilowatt hours of energy. Heating firewood, 1.5 cords of softwood, which is almost 9,000. Uh, kilowatt hours. Heating and propane, <clears throat> I would cook stove, so this is just for a gas stove that I, when I'm too rushed or lazy to um, fire up the wood cook stove. Uh, so that's 20 pounds, which works out to 126 kilowatt hours. And then electricity, I'm net zero, and I have a 75 watt system. And uh, Joshua, if you'd put that light on, that's 75 watts. Maximum power when the sun is at full power. And so I get, you know, an average of three hours at 75 watts. So um, <clears throat> it's not much. So, uh, <clears throat> so the total for me comes out to 18,246. For continuous power, converting that, it's a little over 2,000. So it looks like I'm almost there. But there are a lot of societal impacts. And when you go to the ecological <clears throat> footprints, they tell you to, um, to go to the country you are. And it, takes into account how the country's set up. And there are larger things like expenditures for public uh, services, military, and so on, that aren't factored in here. And we individually 
can't do anything about them in the day-to-day -day living, except maybe uh, do some Occupy Wall Street stuff or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> so, and then, um, how did, how did, how do, uh, what kind of things do I do to, uh, to do this? So, it's a small house, 600 square feet, passive solar, um, <clears throat> wood cook stove, uh, low head water from a, a gravity feed um, well, or a spring rather, um, <clears throat> and no refrigerator. I use a root cellar. You don't really need a refrigerator in Vermont. And, and if, by the way, if anyone's interested in seeing how this is all done, I give tours of my place. A lot of people have come through, so just contact me and we can set up a tour to show you how I do some of these mini little ridiculous things to save energy. <clears throat> um, little trash, maybe two bags a year. I go once a year to the dump and I wash the trash so it doesn't smell bad. <clears throat> um, and then I grow my own food, so it's local food mostly. And uh, use my bicycle to go to the store that's about a half a mile away. <clears throat> Those are basically some of the ways you can take conservation to its limits. And, um, you know, I've wondered, is it really a, a great thing to do because if you can see most of the stuff comes in transportation and heating and firewood um, so <clears throat> I've had some doubts about living living simply this way but you know, I think it's the way to go and we have to do it <clears throat> now <clears throat> for the home in Warren um, we have a hybrid Kenny has a hybrid Honda hybrid We've used 291 gallons of gas this year, which works out to almost 10,000 kilowatt hours. We use about three cords of hardwood, 21,000 kilowatt hours. Heating propane, 230 gallons uh, average through the years, six, over 6,000. Net zero because we got a photovoltaic system. And so, and so it works out to, uh, should be 38,000 instead of a, a period there. And that's about, double of what um, adamant is. And this is a bigger house, probably over 2,000 square feet. Um, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> in my house in adamant, it's built-in conservation. I don't have any option. I mean, I've only got so much power. I've got a, a wood cook stove and it, I have to fire that up. Uh, <clears throat> only so much water, it trickles out of the tap, so I can't uh, use too much. But here in Warren, it's sort of a continuous conscious continuous operation uh, we, we do uh, such things as um, putting the shades down at night uh, closing down part of the house during winter um, <clears throat> and um, actually one of the extreme things we do is we save the bath water and flush the toilets with it we actually had somebody come over and wondered why our meter wasn't working because we use so little water uh, <clears throat> so those are some of the kinds of things we do uh, in Warren, um, and you can see it isn't much different for a bigger house. So there are, there are different kinds of things going on here <clears throat> that aren't taken into account, I think. <clears throat> so I guess the lesson from this is pay attention to the big things, transportation, heating, um, and electricity is really a smaller part. Um, the electricity in Warren, um, I think we use less than 200 kilowatt hours per month, and that's a lot lower, and, and the, the system actually is, is putting power out into the community. Any questions so far? What the continuous power? <clears throat> it means it means that um, <clears throat> that 75 watts right there. If you leave that on all the time, that's continuous power. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> the energy is is what you add up over time. So if you <clears throat> if you leave that on for 
24 hours, you multiply 75 watts times 24 hours and you'll get the watt hours or kilowatt hours which you read on electric meter. <coughs> So one of the things uh, <clears throat> when we do uh, efficiency, um, take actions on efficiency, one of the, my sort of biggest concerns is that um, we will um, just consume more rather than uh, use the efficiency to lessen energy use. And there was a study in, um, in Switzerland have it here. In the time period from 1900 to 2000 uh, century, lighting efficiency improved from 300 lumens, um, <clears throat> 300 lumens per watt to four, 300 uh, lumens per watt to four I'm sorry, 300 watts per lumen and down to four watts per lumen. In other words, a lot less energy um, to make the same lighting. It's sort of like the LEDs we have now. And in the same period, um, the electrical usage went from almost zero in 1900 to 6,000 gigawatts per year in Switzerland. So it really ramped up. Part of that's societal and you need lighting for certain operations going on. but uh, in this case, um, I can almost see it here happening in the valley. Um, we have the LEDs. There are a lot more Christmas lights up. Um, so it seems like maybe we're using the same amount of energy, but we can't tell unless we make some measurements, and that's another talk. So, <clears throat> so really, we have to worry that um, efficiency is really not conservation. <clears throat> So I had, I, to prepare this talk, I took a look at the uh, Vermont uh, energy plan that's uh, being drafted right now and we commented on. And uh, there isn't a lot I could see on conservation. Um, and uh, unless we have a good plan, uh, both for individuals and societally, I can see us being in the same kind of pickle we are in now a couple decades from now. <clears throat> So uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of little things we can do, and um, um, <clears throat> we've got to do them even though they're small, you know, just to get into practice. But some of the bigger problems that are going to have, ta have to be tackled, and we'll have to do them on a societal scale, is population. Uh, <clears throat> the growth of the economy um, <clears throat> and more consumption is the other one. We have a growth economy. That's got to change to a conservation economy somehow. What, whether we can do that uh, is going to be a big, um, a big thing. And then there's the thing that's being talked about now, corporate personhood, trying to keep it the way it is. <clears throat> and then political gridlock in Congress. And there's no united effort by nations. Uh, Durban, South, Af South Africa, uh, they're really thinking about maybe we'll have something by 2020 which is not acceptable if we're going to do something about it. And then um, we've got climate change already weighing in, like Irene, where we have a lot of energy used to repair. And uh, those are energy costs. So we're ramp the climate change will ramp up the energy we use to take care of ourselves. So it's a, it's a uh, positive feedback loop in using more energy. Um, <clears throat> So my response to all these big problems uh, is uh, a short story that I uh, used to tell as I went around the state starting courses on sustainable living and simple living when I worked for the Vermont Earth Institute a few years back. <clears throat> and maybe it's the way to take energy conservation to its limits 
And I'd just like to read that to you. It's called The uh, <clears throat> Northerner and the Neapolitan. A northerner making his way along the Via Caraziola saw a fisherman stretched out in the shade by the seawall, enjoying his rest. What are you doing lying about there, asked a northerner. It's only 10 o'clock. <clears throat> I've already done my fishing. I've sold my fish, and now I'm resting, replied the Neapolitan. If you did a little more work, you could catch more fish, said the northerner. And then, inquired the Neapolitan. And then you would have more money. And then? Then you'd be able to buy a net. And then? Why then, fool, you could get a bigger catch. And then? Then you'd have money to buy a bigger boat. And then? Exasperated, the northerner patiently explained. Then you would own a beautiful villa, servants, everything you could possibly want. Yes, repeated the Neapolitan, and then what? Why must I explain everything to you, shouted the northerner. By this time, of course, you could lie down and rest. But that is what I am now doing, replied the Neapolitan. So my answer to this is just uh, take it easy, rest. Don't consume so much. Don't grow. And... Uh, on a personal level, that's what we can do, and then maybe occupy Wall Street. So I don't know, maybe there's time for questions right now. I don't know how you want to uh, do this, John. Okay, thank you very much. Try this. Maybe not. So I'll probably have to read my slides here. So as uh, Joshua mentioned, I'm the Waitsfield Energy Coordinator, but I also work with uh, Dennis Derryberry on supporting the local volts, which is the Mad River Valley's kind of uh, kind of energy arm. Uh, from a long-term planning perspective. And, you know, as we can see tonight, we definitely have a long ways of engaging the community in a really constructive way to talk about energy and energy efficiency and conservation, as Richard mentioned. Um, one of the things that really has stood out for me is, you know, that we have in this valley a lot of small businesses that uh, really could use a lot of help you know, especially in this economy. Um, and a lot of those small businesses have owners that live in the valley. And so what is good for the home is also good for the business. Thank you. All right. So this is the, the story of my life, the evolution of a business ambassador. Um, so in, in 2010, Efficiency Vermont launched an initiative uh, that was built off a prior initiative where they had local volunteers go out into the community and try to do in-home kind of uh, direct install energy efficiency measures like CFLs, uh, doing some pipe wrap on hot water pipes, but also looking to sit down at the kitchen table and kind of the way that Richard was discussing is look at you know what a homeowner's energy usage is like, what the issues they have, and try to discuss with them the options that they have and realize the tremendous amount of resources that are available in the state to support their efforts. Um, so in 2010, they launched the Business Ambassador Initiative where they were essentially trying to get local um, folks to go out to the businesses with a little bit of training and try to help them understand specific measures uh, that could help improve their efficiency. Um, but because the way Efficiency Vermont is designed, and just because of that a lot of efficiency measures are very complicated uh, uh, things to understand, not only for a business owner, but especially for somebody that's just trying to volunteer to do some outreach. And so it tended to be very focused on lighting. And one thing that came up in 2011 was Joshua brought to our attention that uh, there was a grant from the uh, 
Vermont Community Foundation where they had utilized energy monitors in Middlebury to go out to local businesses in order to try to help them understand what their energy usage looked like and then try to work with them to develop plans and target actions from that. So you never know what you're going to get and I'm, I'm always somebody that's always looking to get free stuff. So we put in an application, Joshua, uh, myself, uh, Dennis, and, um, and Kate from Yestermorrow. And we won, you know, who knew? So we got five energy monitors and we developed a plan and it was really, okay, so we had the Efficiency Vermont Business Ambassador Program, but what's, what's next? You know, how do we really go in and engage the community and the small businesses in the Valley to really try to understand energy usage? So that was our proposal was essentially to go forward and go out and do the outreach, do direct installs of the energy monitors, and then try to essentially help them walk through a plan of how to reduce their energy usage. So this is pretty much what the proposal was. This is an impressive mic. Um, sign up the participants, which is never an easy task. You know, even as we're doing some local initiatives right now for energy efficiency and trying to give energy uh, audit rebates out, uh, trying to get participation is often harder than you would think. Um, but then is really to try to sit down, install the energy monitor, but and develop a baseline. So it's like, what does it look like today for those small businesses? How are they using their energy? You know, what happens in the morning? What happens during the day? What happens when they go home at the end of the day? What does their energy usage look like? And then once you review that with the business owner, is to then develop a plan of attack and start target, targeting the low cost, the no cost measures, which are the conservation. And one of the historical issues with conservation has always been from a state level with an energy plan or efficiency Vermont, is if you can't measure it, they can't do it because they're held up against the utility cost test, which essentially says, you know, they can only do things that they can prove are cost effective for homeowners. And even though we all sit here and say conservation is king, um, because they can't measure it and they can't ensure that it's gonna have staying power, um, they tend not to support it. So you'll get Efficiency Vermont coming out with energy tips for winter energy tips, but they don't actually claim any savings on it. So you don't see a lot of effort behind it because they can't measure it. So that was one thing that we were trying to change, is develop this plan of attack, but then use the monitor to essentially back it up to give them motivation as they see the type of change that Richard was talking about, and that you can incrementally make improvements. So uh, businesses aren't created equal. So you look at the Warren store, and you walk into the store and they have a lot on display. They have a lot of lighting and they have a lot of refrigeration and they have a small deli. You go upstairs and they have 56 track heads, which were halogens that were stalled up there. And talking to Jack Garvin, you know, who's the, the business owner, he has a whole bunch of different issues. The cost of energy is one thing, but some of the other issues is that during the summer, during the 4th of July parade, that the temperature upstairs is just ridiculously high. And so you start to realize that there, there are other things that are important to somebody that aren't that may be tied to energy, but aren't necessarily um, things that rise to the top, that they're aware of that they can't, they, they never knew that one was tied to the other. So, Identifying opportunities, one, and this was part of the Business Ambassador Program, was saying, okay, let's replace all those halogens upstairs with LEDs. And so not only are you reducing your energy consumption, but you're also reducing the temperature upstairs coming from the heat, the wasted heat off all those halogens during the summer. And then as a comparison, you have Yestermorrow, which is an office space. And so you, you can find these pie, pie charts online um, and they really don't differ from one business to another. One might have higher energy usage than another, but generally the pie chart looks the same. You have the percentages of the energy consumption. In the Northeast, obviously we're dominated by heating as a core element for businesses, but also around lighting, air conditioning, refrigeration, depending on the type of business. So, 
as I mentioned, the first thing that we did was baseline monitoring. So we go in and install these energy monitors in the electrical panel in the business. And so right there is finding, okay, who's an electrician in the valley that's a engaged electrician that would like to learn more about how to potentially upsell, you know, the person that they work with very closely. So Jack essentially has an electrician that works closely with them. So who better to have coming up to speed on how to understand the numbers that are coming out of the energy monitor. So what you can see here is that in this up top, it just talks about the, the types of loads that are there. Anytime you can see a very steep rise early in the morning, and that's pretty much from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., that a steep rise tends to, be, tends to be things that you can turn on very quickly, and that's lighting. So right there, you can start to recognize, okay, these are the things that are starting to turn on as soon as somebody walks in to open up the business in the morning. And this will be different from a business that's an office space versus something like the Warren Store or American Flatbread. Then you look at what's happening between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. So here you, and I'll show this on the next slide, but here you have a fairly high continuous load. And that is something that you really want to focus on. And why that is so high for the Warren Store is because of refrigeration. You know, typically they go home at the end of the night, they turn off all the lights, but the refrigeration is still running. So if you have an old or inefficient, you know, compressor or evaporator, it's going to tend to consume a lot of energy, even at night, all based on the temperature outside the building. Um, but so it, it starts to identify the things that you can target for a, a attack plan, you know, sit down with the business owner and essentially try to understand, okay, lighting, here's a clear high intensity energy usage where you have a new technology coming out with LEDs or CFLs that can dramatically not only reduce your energy load, but reduce the heat upstairs and potentially provide a better atmosphere for selling, you know, um, you know, selling clothing or jewelry or anything else in the building. back to that one. So the one other thing I noticed is that this is the different curves there are different days of the week. So essentially like a Monday to Friday. And I said, okay, they all look the same and except there's one curve. There's the blue one that's dramatically lower than all the other curves. I'm like, you know, how could that be? You know, it's like, you know, did they do something different that day? But it's the whole shape was exactly the same. It's just shifted down. And then I started to realize could it be the weather? So sure enough, I look online, check the weather, and that day was about 20 degrees cooler than the other days. So you say, okay, what's affected when it's cooler outside? And it's refrigeration. So just in seeing that, you start to understand the, the, the size of reduction that the Warren store could achieve by high efficiency refrigeration. So taking the next steps, and you know, some of it was, I spoke to this, is you know, looking at the easy stuff. So they've already gone ahead and replaced all of their track uh, lighting, or most of it upstairs, with LEDs. So right there is just, it's a step change in energy reduction for the lighting. And then it's looking at refrigeration. And this is the same for, for homeowners versus business owners. A lot of folks just can't take on a sizable debt you know, the, from an operational perspective. Even though this stuff makes clear sense that people have to do things in little steps. And so having that plan, have that long-term vision for where you want to be, makes a lot of sense for the, whether it's a homeowner or a business owner. So next step, and Jack's clearly aware of this, is okay, I, I've got, you know, condensers and evaporators that are, you know, they're very, very old. And, and he knows that you can hear them, they're, running rough, he's talked to his electrician about it, and he's just not there yet. But this is something where, you know, ha being able to understand the type of reduction that you can get, it helps essentially a business owner make the case for why it would make sense to do the upgrade now versus later. Sorry, I jumped over the heating. You know, another clear thing, whether it's, you know, at the Warren store, the heating issue upstairs is not just because of the lighting. 
it's because essentially there's very poor insulation and air sealing in the building. It's an old you know, building. And so you really have to do the type of energy retrofits, the air sealing and insulation, to not only make it consume less energy, but to make it a more comfortable space to either live in or to run a business in. So this is a, a picture from today. Um, and this is an iPhone, so it actually looks a lot brighter and a lot nicer than it does here. Um, but one of the initiatives, uh, as I did this uh, business ambassador program, and I reached out to Jack about the, the LED lighting, he went and got one sample, tried it out, he liked it, realized it was a phenomenal deal through Efficiency Vermont to move towards LED lighting. And so not only did he make the decision there, but the same person that does the buying for the Warren store all, also makes the purchasing decisions for the artisan's gallery as well as the picture in. So you start to realize that there's a lot of interconnectedness to the valley and that you don't have to hit all the people, you just have to hit the right people to help them understand the energy usage patterns of their business and how to make the right decisions. And then when one person becomes a case study then all the other folks can understand, okay, my business is just like that person's business. What if I do the same things that they do? Will I see the same type of energy reductions? Will I see the same type of savings? And will my business have a better operations you know, from, a, from a financial perspective because of that? Uh, all right. I swear I didn't mean to do animation here. Um, okay. So, as I mentioned at the start, is that you know no single energy coordinator is going to be able to do this alone. You know, no single person is going to be out there to make these decisions. A business owner, they're very busy people that have a hard time making these decisions just by themselves. You kind of get paralyzed from indecision. So really, it's all about developing the team. And so, efficiency in Vermont is a huge one, meaning that they have energy consultants on staff. You know, you have local energy leaders. You know, you have a few folks speaking here tonight. You know, Brad Cook, you know, CBCAC, you know, Richard, you know, it, uh, you know, people like to say, well, the Matter Valley has the highest density of architects in the world. I would argue that we have the highest density of energy professionals in the world. You know, a few of my friends are here tonight and they're all ex-Northern Power folks. But they're all, or some of them are still with the beast, so to speak. But, uh, but the rest of us are at other places, you know, Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, you know, Efficiency Vermont, um, and other good friends at All Earth Renewables. So it, it's really just about understanding what does the suite of options look like for the Matter of Valley and how do we make the right decisions for this valley. But the second part is, is the contractors. You know, just like I said, you know, here's Jack at the Warren store that has an electrician that he trusts and he has a long-term relationship with. Is you know, who are the other contractors in this valley that really have the businesses or the homeowner's ear in making the right decisions? So when that opportunity does come along, when they do want to replace their refrigeration, or the homeowner does want to replace their heating system, that that contractor is helping them make the right decisions from a long-term perspective and not just from a short-term perspective. And the last one from a business uh, perspective is you really need somebody within the business to be the champion. You know, and ideally, maybe that's the person that either opens up and closes down the business you know, every day. You know, because half of it, you know, really, you, know, you don't want to pay through the nose to get a new heating system or air conditioning or new lighting when you could be doing the conservation steps that could really reduce the energy load as long as you just do things wisely. But then it's just to make that plan and have somebody be responsible for following through on it. So that's it. Any questions or maybe we'll save them for afterwards? Come on guys, I know you want to ask. <laughs> Hello, Chris McKay from uh, Waterbury, Vermont. I had a question. Uh, also from Northern Power, yes. 
wind turbines, 100 kilowatt wind turbine. You can get one for the valley here. The, uh, it, something that's always occurred to me that's, that seemed like a possibility, but I, I'm not really familiar with uh, technologies that are out there besides sort of some homespun things, are you know all winter long, whether it's businesses or homes, everyone's paying to run their refrigerators and refrigeration uh, while outside it's basically as cold or colder than those refrigerators. And it just seems that with, uh, you know, there, there must be some creative, uh, well, there must be some commercial ways to take advantage of that. And I didn't know if, uh, I don't know, there's some laughing up front. Maybe this was mentioned earlier, but the, uh, it, it just feels like that's a, an oppor a big opportunity. This sounds like a sales pitch for a business in the matter of a valley. Does anybody will want to address that? It's free air. So. So who knew you could sell free air? <laughs> so. So is that in installed at the Warren store then? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. So it's just really in the uh, in the summer months where they have those refrigeration yep. modes. And uh, that's you know that dramatic drop that you saw in the energy consumption is in large part associated with that. Great. Thanks. I'll have to uh, read up on that. Then. You, you can you can put your refrigerator outside and it works the same way I think. <laughs> yes, Richard. That's right. Tom Wilson from Barocco, Wisconsin, and Warren, Vermont, uh, kind of moving back and forth at this point. Um, I had the um, pleasure, oh, it must be now 15 or 20 years ago, working with your colleague at VEIC, Ken Talanaka, going around um, as part of uh, low-income weatherization evaluations and elsewhere of, of tracking pre- and post-energy consumption on, on weatherized houses using whole house energy monitors. Um, what you are showing here is, you know, is, is wonderful for you. You're looking specifically at, at electrical load, just something like that. But for the larger picture of, 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 of looking at, at all energy conservation, where you want to be tracking multiple things, you know, using a data logger to, 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 to collect multiple points of, of information and collecting them over a period of time is, is a real valuable tool. The problem is I see very little of that being done anymore. It seems like most of our energy programs are now relying on what I consider fairly specious computer modeling to, to both predict pre and post consumption and people aren't really going in and actually measuring what people are using before and after. And as a result, I think we're, we're losing that, that feedback and that, and that insight uh, and just sort of going along and sort of repeating the same kinds of things like we already know what the answers are. Do you, do you know of anybody who's doing any, any larger scale monitoring of, 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 of residential consumption? You mean like smart grid? I mean, I, mean, I know exactly what well, you mean. Smart grid's still just electrical. It, I mean, it you is. Know, it, it's but, but what I'd say is that the people that are doing it, it it's, it's your bills. You know, at the end of the day, Monitoring the, you know, whether it's electricity usage or fuel usage is only as good as its ability to help inform you as to the decisions that you need to make and then help you make those decisions. You know, and so, you know, you have a building performance contractor uh, that will speak next. And, and really that's what it's about is that, you know, every homeowner, every business needs that advisor, you know, so that they can sit down with them and actually test their heating system you know, test, you know, with a blower door to see, you know, what type of air leaks do you have in your house? Because even if you can understand your energy consumption, 
you know, whether it's from a fuel basis or an electric basis, it doesn't necessarily get you to the next level. And that's, that's where it's really important, one, to either have a neighbor to neighbor type of conversation where somebody is making the improvements and most houses are very similar in nature, but then is to also have an advisor that's somebody that's actually giving you an energy assessment to help you make the right decisions. Well, I mean, I, I certainly value that, that service that I'm participating in myself, but my point is even the best of the energy advisors today are not really working on real proven energy savings. We're working on, 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 on modeling and unless we're actually measuring true results of, of, of total energy consumption, I don't think, I don't think we're, I think we're, we're losing out on opportunities. Yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, we all pay our bills, and 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 that's what. Yeah, well, I mean, but that but that's the thing is that you can you know unless you're testing essentially the efficiency of your heating system, and one homeowner is not necessarily you know the same as the next homeowner. Somebody might be doing a high level of conservation either because they can't afford it, and so they're forced into conservation, or you have other people that are essentially doing making their own personal decisions. But then, you know, so you could have the same household and have completely different consumption patterns. And so I, I think that what, you know, Efficiency Vermont and other programs try to do is really try to create long-term solutions and try to encourage the market-based approach. But they can't get to the ground level. I mean, that's where the community really comes in, is that they, they can work very well in a retail storefront, say supporting CFLs or LEDs, um, but or they're very good at working with very large commercial customers, yeah, you know, because that's the type of funding and the ability for them to go in and, and make a big difference in those type of customers or those type of retail establishments. But when you bring it to the ground level, the responsibility then falls to individual, you know, contractors or to an energy coordinator or a few energy advocates in a valley to try to make a difference. And, and I think that's, you know, to your point, is that not only do you need to meter it, but you need to raise the level of awareness and engagement from a community level. And, um, and I don't think a lot of people have the, you know, nobody has the right answers yet. I think we're still searching for them. So. Speaking of looking at answers and looking at weather yes. um, the next part of Hi, my name's Lori Fielder, and I'm a project manager at Central Vermont Community Action Council. And um, Community Action's been around a really long time, and um, we have a number of, um, of programs that are mainly um, focused at, um, for people who are um, low income or even uh, medium income, but um, Community Action, there's, there's five community action agencies around the state um, and we all have different service areas, and um, the valley is our service is in our service area, and um, so we you know we run programs like Head Start, and we have a food shelf, and we have a number of of, of um, like small business programs and so forth. Um, I work for the Weatherization Program, and um, we have. We really have worked hard at not just reaching low-income people, but all Vermonters. Um, we realize that everybody lives somewhere in the state, and um, you know, you might live in a, a you know a mobile home or an apartment or um, a single-family house. Um, um, so, because we all share that, we we worked hard at um, addressing. Um, energy conservation and efficiency in in your home so um, we do everything for from uh, the 
the no cost weatherization program that services um, income eligible participants and um, you know our crews will go in and do an energy audit and weatherize a home for a low income um, client of ours um, we've, we've serviced many 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 low income people um, over the years and um, we also have a fee for service um, part of our agency uh, of the weatherization group and that's called energy smart and um, and we also run a lot of energy education programs that help everybody ranging from button-up um, presentations and I'm sure many of you have been to a button-up presentation or know what it is um, to weatherization skill shops which is designed to help people do their own project um, their own home energy renovation project um, so that's what community action is and um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is um, you know one of the things that people ask us all the time um, once they learn what weatherization really means that it's not a plastic window kit um, and it's not you know probably a lot of people think well it's just the foam weather stripping around your door once once you understand that weatherization in your home is um, is a whole house process people ask well where do we start and um, you know you start at the beginning and and we've decided that this beginning this whole process is a path and um, we developed this um, this poster which is not in its very final stages but this is pretty close um, that that we call the pathway to a comfortable affordable Vermont home so it, it starts it always starts at an energy audit um, or an energy assessment and um, I don't know how many how many people here I just want to see how many people up here have had an energy assessment at their house so you know probably five or six people here so if you've had an energy assessment you you probably already know that you learn more in that assessment than you wish you ever did know <laughs> about your house um, it can be um, it can be kind of a grueling process for some people especially if you you know it is your home and you you feel connected to it and you feel a little bit um, you know wondering if you're being judged about what someone's saying about your house um, we built my husband and I built our own house and when we had our energy audit done it was it was sort of humbling because we thought we were doing a really good job and then realized we we had a lot of holes to fix um, so so as you go as you look this worksheet over I mean the best thing to do is sort of um, read it over and digest it um, you learn that there's um, you know you start at the beginning you go through this process of hiring an energy auditor or you know an energy contractor Brad Cook is an energy contractor here in the valley um, and you know he'll come and do an assessment of your home you'll get a report you'll know what your priorities are at your house um, you're gonna learn a lot about air sealing you'll learn a lot about insulation and you'll hear about health and safety measures that you'll probably need to work on some of the things um, you know if, if you qualify for low-income weatherization um, there's even some things you still may need to do even if they're even if our crew comes to your house and does the project you might have knob and tube wiring we can't we can't do the weatherization if you have that you you need to address that and fix it um, you might find out that you have vermiculite that's a whole nother problem I'll let Brad deal with that um, clear out your basement well that can be really a big barrier for some people I mean everybody has junk in their basement um, you might have had that addressed for you this summer if uh, if the water ran through your basement which I know many people in this area had um, you might have to fix your roof you know weatherization is not going to come in and put a bunch of cellulose in the attic when there's holes in the roof and it's going to get wet so there's things you have to fix sometimes then you have to figure out how you're going to pay for it so you don't qualify for weather for low-income weatherization now what um, you know like Chris said at this point in time many people don't want to incur a big debt to pay for for anything you know whether it's college ed education or a new car or 
you know you have to make your budget stretch so you might you might decide that you have a you owned your home long enough you can get a home equity loan um, and use that um, you might have saved you know a few thousand dollars that you can that you can put towards this a home energy renovation can start at three or four thousand uh, dollars you know if you hire somebody to do the whole thing and it, it might run you fifteen thousand dollars it's they they're not cheap it's it's not you know something that you take lightly you know if you redo your kitchen you're probably going to spend the same amount of money that you would renovating your your house for energy efficiency and you're not going to have beautiful countertops granite countertops at the end and you're not going to have stainless steel appliances to show off to people but you'll have a warmer more comfortable and efficient house um, so you have to sort of come to terms with that and make peace with it if that's what you want to do. Um, and, and, then, and then so you've made your plan, you know how you're going to finance it. You, maybe it's taken you three or four or five months to figure this out. So then you need to decide if you're going to do your own work, if you're going to do some of it, if you're going to hire a professional to do all of it. Um, and there are various options for that. Um, Efficiency Vermont does now um, offer incentives to homeowners who do their own work, but you do need to use um, an, a building, um, a BPI certified auditor, a contractor to help you with that. If you want to go that route, you can do it, um, but you do need to follow the BPI protocol. Um, which means you, you need to air seal and insulate the way your work scope, you know, you'll get your work scope from your auditor. You need to follow it. Um, if you haven't, he's going to tell you to fix it before you proceed. Um, and um, the do-it-yourself option is nice for a lot of Vermonters. A lot of Vermonters want to do their own work. Um, you know, so you, you start your project. Uh, the, the auditor will come back mid-project and check your work. You have consultation time with them. Um, they'll even do a step in the middle called blower door assisted air sealing, which means they set the blower door up um, in your house and they let it run while you chase leaks. So you can go around your house and fill all those little cracks, all those little things that maybe you, d you missed when you did your um, first pass. And that's important because the better job you do air sealing, the, the more you're going to get with um, your rebates. So make sure you do a good job with that part. And then at the end, um, then if you get the all clear from your, your auditor to go ahead and blow insulation in your attic or whatever the next step is, you can do that. He'll come back at the end and test you out and file your project with Efficiency Vermont for incentives. And, you know, maybe you spent three, four, five thousand dollars on the whole project that you might have spent. 12 or 15 on and you will be eligible for you know the average incentive from efficiency Vermont's about fifteen hundred dollars you know I I want to stress that you don't do this because of incentives though you do it because of long-term savings you can save you know up to 30 percent on your energy um, bills your heating your heating bills if you do this but you do need um, you need to consider that you're not just doing this for a one-time incentive check um, so that's basically the, the, the part where you, where you finish with this cute little typical looking Vermont house is that, you know, you know, you've done the work one way or another. You either qualify for low income, no cost weatherization. Just a warning, our waiting list is now six months. There's a lot of people in the queue. Um, if, you are, if you had flood damage, though, um, we are prioritizing flooded people. So you might be higher on the list. So either no cost uh, weatherization, hire a contractor to do the whole job, and, and believe me, after you are up in your attic or in your basement for about uh, <laughs> a few hours, you'll know why people hire a professional to do the whole thing, um, or, or you attempt to do it yourself. Um, and all of them are, are good options. You pick what path is right for you. Um, that's why we put this together. Um, hopefully people got to see the trailer outside you can kind of get um, an idea as to what your house might you know which which part of the trailer reminds you of your house 
and um, you know I hope that um, I hope that Waitsfield folks were able to sign up for tomorrow night's skill shop we're using these props um, to, to demonstrate to people what the measures are that they can do in their own home and um, so that's that's tomorrow night from 5 to 8 and um, now I'm going to hand it over to Brad to talk a little bit more about the specifics on um, the home performance with Energy Star and the um, the details with the technical part because that's what he's good at. Brad. Good evening. I'm Brad Cook. I'm the owner of Building Performance Services. We're a home performance contractor here in the Matter Valley. Um, like many home performance contractors, uh, we work with Efficiency Vermont as independent contractors to help administer some of their programs that I'll talk to you about in a moment. Um, I am certified by the Building Performance Institute, BPI. A um, lot of information on their website, bpi.org. Um, all contractors that are working with Efficiency Vermont are certified by BPI. And our company is also accredited by BPI. There's three accredited companies in Vermont. Um, Efficiency Vermont has a list of all these contractors on their website, Efficiency Vermont, written out, dot org, or dot com, either one works. Um, and what we do is we go in to a home and look at the whole home. We work with the Home Performance with Energy Star program. So another very good website is energystar.gov, energystar, one word, dot gov, and look on um, home performance on that website and it gives you lots of information about what we're talking about tonight air sealing moisture insulation and so forth and the home performance with energy star program is looking at the whole house because frequently when you change one thing you affect something else and many times the solution to the moisture up in the attic or the cold wall is not one solution so the way I look at it as the BPI contractors, we come into a home, we're the doctor, we're assessing the patient, we are coming up with a diagnosis or diagnoses, we are writing a prescription, and we are offering to fill that prescription. Um, and when we do that, we're looking at holistically the whole house. Our assessment includes a blower door test. We set up a calibrated fan with a digital pressure meter in the main entry of, of the house close all the windows and doors, and we start depressurizing the house. Uh, as we blow the air out of the house, all the air is leaking back in through the cracks and crevices. We can then measure the flow rate through that fan at a given pressure. So we can compare to other homes, and we can repeat that test when we're done, so we can quantify how well we've air sealed that house. Uh, we also look at insulation. How much do you have? What kind? How well is it installed? How well is it being, is it performing? Um, you may have different kinds. I've seen homes with four different kinds of insulation in four different walls in the same room. Um, we look at your heating equipment. Don't believe, you know, changing the boiler is not going to save you huge amounts of energy. If you have a, a boiler that's operating at 80% and you put in a new one that goes to 90%, you're saving 10% of your fuel bill. At what cost? $10,000? That money is better spent on air sealing and insulating first, unless your boiler is just dying. Um, windows and doors. We do a lot of things with tuning up, weather stripping windows and doors. Replacing them is very expensive. It's an average of $600 a window. We have better recommendations. So we're going to do this assessment, look at the whole house, do some testing on your heating equipment, your combustion equipment, your hot water heater, give you recommendations. Uh, that are cost effective and as Laurie pointed out this project may cost between three and fifteen thousand dollars sometimes a little more if you do have to replace the heating replace the heating system but look at the economics besides being a house being more comfortable and safer let's say you're spending four thousand dollars a year in heating right now if we can save twenty percent with a reasonable effort that's eight hundred dollars a year over 10 years, if we were to spend $8,000, we would have paid that project back within 10 years at today's fuel prices. And we know fuel prices are only going to go up. 
So that's kind of the parameters we work with. So um, there are three paths that I'm going to talk to you about tonight on achieving these goals. One is the Home Performance with Energy Star program. Another is the Do-It-Yourself program. And then another is the Small Business program, what Efficiency Vermont's calling the Building Performance program for any of you business owners, small business owners out there. Uh, behind me are some of the props that Lori was referring to that go with the trailer out front. These were created by Central Vermont Community Action, and we use these as part of the do-it-yourself program that we're going to work with tomorrow night. Um, if any of you are thinking of doing the do-it-yourself workshop tomorrow night, um, please contact Chris Badger or the town clerk um, or one of us tonight. Um, there's still some room. This prop behind me is uh, showing a typical combination of problems you might find in an attic. One of the most common is a central chimney where there's a chimney chase around it down on the second floor. Sometimes I've gone up into an attic and I've seen a huge wide chase around that chimney that I could actually climb down in there with air going all the way down to the basement. So we show you in the do-it-yourself program how we can seal that off, stop that air from leaking up into the attic. Here we have a bathroom fan. Many times I've seen bathroom fans vented just up into the attic. I've seen this dryer vent hose just stuck down into the soffit, and the soffit's black from mildew and rot. We have a recessed light over here. Those are biggies. Lots of not only the heat from the recessed light itself, but a lot of air leaking up. We show you how we can seal that off to stop the air from leaking out. And we have pipe penetrations. We have knob and tube wiring over here. We have the attic access hatch. Show you methods of how to seal that off. Over here, we go to the basement. Typical band joist sitting above the foundation. These uh, lockers that hold some of our supplies are pretending to be the foundation with your, your sill going around there. So we show you how you can insulate that. And over here we have the double hung windows and there's a lot of things we can do with weather stripping and sash locks to tighten those up. And then doors. Uh, how do you weather strip a door? How do you tighten up a door? Sometimes it's very simple. Um, basement doors are a biggie. A lot of them in older homes are homemade but there's a lot of things we can do to make them better insulated and better air sealed. Um, so the three programs that we look at are the Home Performance with Energy Star. This is the main program that Efficiency Vermont runs. They offer incentives, cash incentives, for people that want to um, improve the energy efficiency of their home. Any of these programs, as Lori pointed out, you have to start with an energy audit. Um, if you don't measure, we can't incentivize, as Chris pointed out. So if you don't have that blower door test before any work is done, then you, you can't go for the incentives. You can't quantify the incentives. Um, I, we do have literature over here on the Home Performance with Energy Star program and what the incentives are. Basically, it starts with air sealing. The tighter you can make the house, the more incentives you get. And the second part is uh, um, insulation. If you don't have much insulation and you add to a certain level, you'll get so much a square foot. If you've already got a reasonable amount of insulation, there's no incentive to add more. Um, and all of that, you have to deal with health and safety first. So if you've got a lot of moisture in the basement, you've got to correct that first, because if you make the house tighter, you're just going to make it more concentrated. You're going to have mold and mildew issues. Um, if you have carbon monoxide issues, um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen heating systems that backdraft into the house, putting carbon monoxide into the house. Um, those things have to be addressed. They have to be fixed. Um, cook stoves, propane-fired cook stoves that put out uh, hundreds or thousands of parts per million of carbon monoxide because they weren't installed right, or the gas supply line was kinked, or something like that. The burners aren't working right. Um, 
Home Performance with Energy Star program, you have to start with an energy audit by a BPI certified contractor on their uh, website, on their list. You do the improvements, um, have the contractor do the improvements, they test out to show how much they've improved, and they fill out the, the forms, the paperwork, to Efficiency Vermont, and you can receive up to $2,500 in cash incentives. That is roughly, has been roughly 8, 10, 12 percent of the cost of a project. Um, and roughly, most projects are earning roughly in the ballpark of an average of $1,500 per project. Um, the second program is the do-it-yourself program. Uh, this was started a year ago. It has now been accepted by Efficiency Vermont. The do-it-yourself program requires um, the oversight of an energy auditor that is certified by BPI. And again, this work, we have to be sure that any work that's done is done properly, it's going to last a long time, and is done in a safe manner. You're not creating an unsafe condition. So there has to be close supervision by a certified BPI auditor. Starts with an energy audit. The auditor gives a comprehensive report and says specifically, this is what you're going to have to do. This is, you know, you have to work with the, the homeowner and see what their capability is and come up with a plan, a scope of work. The homeowner hopefully will take a do-it-yourself workshop where you're going to work with these props, learn some of the techniques that, that we use to air seal a home and put in the insulation. And after you take the workshop, the homeowner is going to go and do the work. And maybe they start doing the work and they call up and they say, oh my God, Brad, this is just too much. I, I, I can't believe, what, what have I gotten into? You have the option of having the contractor come out and work with you for several hours on the project to keep you going. Turn it over to the contractor, turn it over to another contractor that is certified. Um, there's a, a number of ways you can go. But after the work is done, uh, for air sealing, the contractor comes back in, does the blower door test, and checks to see how well you've done. Oh, you've missed here, you've missed there, let's go ahead and correct those. And once it's, everything is in, in good condition, the contractor will say, okay, go ahead and, and insulate. And maybe you'll decide to go ahead and put in that, I don't like it, but put in fiberglass. Or maybe you're going to put insulation in your flat attic, and you go to Allen Lumber and use their cellulose blowing machine, or maybe you need to stop all the air leaks that are going through your wainscoting in the kitchen, and the only solution is dense pack cellulose. So you'll hire a dense pack cellulose contractor like ourselves to do that part. Once all the insulation is done, the contractor comes back in, does another blower door tests, does some safety tests on your combustion equipment, because now we want to make sure that your boiler or furnace still can get enough combustion air now that the house is tighter, reports to Efficiency Vermont all the results, and Efficiency Vermont will then send the check to the homeowner under the do-it-yourself program. So do-it-yourself, you're going to have to pay more for these extra tests for the auditor. You may have to pay for the auditor to come in and hold your hand for several hours for consultation, but in the end, you're going to save money on all that labor of climbing up into the attic or down in the crawl space and doing that air sealing and dealing with moisture and so forth. The last program is the building performance program. This is geared towards businesses or multifamily. So if you are living in a home or you own a, a building that has more than five units, this could be condominiums, could be apartments, or if you live in a building or own a building that has a residence and a business, and it's less than 10,000 square feet, and it's built as a typical wood frame structure, we're not talking a steel or a concrete structure, and as long as it does not have a restaurant, a grocery store, a delicatessen, or a, I think hospital in there, then you can qualify the, for the building performance program, which will offer up to $7,500 per building. So the incentives are a little bit higher. Um, any questions? Yes. I want to open it up to general questions. 
Um, so if all of our presenters could just sort of be at the front and move away. Urge folks to utilize the microphone uh, in, the, in the center so that your voice is heard by the Sorry, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering, um, in terms of buttoning up the house really tight, what about radon? What's How do you... Radon? Yeah. I remember years ago that... You know, That's you one of the questions we ask when we do... When we do the audit, um, many people do not have not tested their homes. Um, so I, I should point out every auditor is a little different, um, and everyone takes a little. You know that's not a required part of our audit. We are supposed to look at health and safety, but not a lot of emphasis on that. I do emphasize it, and I give people information on getting a test. Um, I recommend the short-term test you can get from the State Department of Health laboratory up in. Burlington. Um, the state also offers a free long-term test that I encourage people to get, but that is a concern. If, in particular, we're going to do any work, we could be tightening up the home and making a radon test, a radon problem even worse. Fifteen percent of the homes that have been tested in Vermont are at or above the EPA action limit of four picocuries per, lim per liter. And only about 15% of the homes in Vermont have even been tested. Thanks. Anybody else? Any other questions? Anybody? Yep. Oh, Stan? Um, one more question for Richard, just so you, um, I have an idea, but um, just so you can help us think about it. What in a what sort of works in a root cellar? You're saying you're using it for everything. Um, but what things can't you be doing in root cellar? In terms, in terms of food preservation or refrigeration uh, or the whole works? Um, well, in general, just uh, sort of saying to someone that's living uh, in a modern home versus if they were to say, OK, I'm not going to have a refrigerator, what is that going to look like? Yes, OK. Well, <clears throat> when I give. Um, tours of my root cellar or give uh, workshops uh, in places, uh, there are just three basic principles that um, you need to uh, look at. And you can usually find places in the home that will take you maybe 80% of the way in most any home. Uh, it's called the 80-20 rule. 80% 80, 80 is easy and the last 20% is hard. There's actually a rule like that. You can look it up on the web. and, and uh, or it, it can work the other way too. The first eighty percent is hard, and the next is easy. Or it's a versatile thing. But so you need temperature. Um, you want to be near freezing for root vegetables and refrigeration. You know, forty degrees and and lower. Um, so look for places that are 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 that can do that. Like a bulkhead down into the basement that can be insulated off in the basement from the furnace, but it's uh, exposed to the outside. It's sort of like a free air system. Refrigerator um, is operable anywhere in Vermont for about six months of the year. To put the stuff anywhere. So, in my place, the refrigerator moves around during the year. You know, in the summer, it's in the basement in the root cellar, and other times it's out on the porch or wherever I need the, the right conditions. So, look around, and certain foods need um, certainly you can't freeze things um, using a root cellar, but you can preserve foods a long time. Um, so, you look around for the right temperature. Um, and you just use a, a thermometer throughout the year and see where it is. Um, and then um, look for um, humidity. Um, root vegetables need, need uh, to be um, kept in a humid environment. And you can do that with a plastic bucket uh, and sawdust at the right, uh, right uh, wetness or dryness. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the other thing is ventilation. Um, in case it gets too warm, bring in some cold air. If it gets too hot, um, if it gets too cold, you need to bring some warm air in. So you just have to look around the house and see what you can do and, and experiment. Does that help? Yes, right, right, right. See, I don't have a freezer, but I have friends, so when I get a deer, it um, goes into neighbor's freezers or my wife's freezer, and um, a little venison and payment, and it works really well. A collective sort of way to do that.
The other question was around um, uh, the, uh, as the program you're saying, building performance program. Um, do farms qualify as businesses within that are residences as well? Farms? Yes. N n my understanding is they do not at this point. Peter Edlin Waitsfield, uh, Northern Power Systems, Commercial Wind Division. We build turbines 23 times larger than our little brothers. Chris, this question's for you. Um, you have five meters in town. Are you continuing to meter the businesses in town in the valley? Uh, yes. I mean, the meters are installed and they're monitoring. Um, as I mentioned, I am the Waitsfield Energy Coordinator, and uh, sometimes you feel like you're a committee of one. So uh, I'm looking out in the audience, and, and I'm definitely recognizing Peter Edlin as a, a engaged and, and well-informed energy advocate. So uh, I'm going to be soliciting your support as part of the uh, that effort. Um, but it, it was a pilot, and really try to get our legs underneath us to understand uh, what does it take to engage. Uh, you know, a small business owner in the valley. Um, and really the sky's the limit from, you know, finding folks that participate, uh, but it, it really is a commitment, meaning you don't want somebody that's just looking for you to come in and provide them answers. Uh, you know, the success that they had in, in Middlebury was really that the business owner is the one that should be the one coming up with the plan. So you're essentially providing them the guidance and support, um, but it's really them that have to make the decisions um, because you can't force whether it's a homeowner or a small business, you can't force people to make the decisions that we might want them to make. They need to find that it's right for them to do that. And, and that's not easy, and, and that's why it's so important to kind of find the right people that are carrying the message. And, uh, and, and I wouldn't say I'm necessarily the right person. So, you know, when I look out into the audience and into the valley, of making sure that the right people are engaged in discussing energy efficiency and not just always preaching to the choir. Um, and so that's something that hopefully in 2012 we'll be able to make a big difference in um, because I, I, there's a lot going on. You know, meaning that this, this initiative around small business is one thing, but uh, Waitsfield is also one of 13 towns that's launching PACE, which is a property assessed clean energy, which uh, you know, is a very interesting new financing mechanism for energy improvements. And that includes both energy efficiency and renewable energy, where you can attach the cost of the energy improvements to your house. And that you pay for those energy improvements over say a 20 year period, just like the way you pay your taxes. And if you move from your house, um, that the next homeowner uh, will essentially take over those payments. And so, you know, what we're constantly trying to do in this, in energy efficiency, or even renewable energy, is, is try to remove those barriers. And those barriers, barriers tend to be the same for business, you know, small businesses as well as, uh, you know, homeowners. So uh, definitely uh, keep your ears open for next year and talk to your other energy coordinators in the Valley. Um, and Dave Frank's here and Jesse Stoll and uh, Karen, Karen's last name? Horn in, in, in Moortown. Jesse's in Warren and David's in Faston. Uh, say about that because Efficiency Vermont was kind of treating the people affected by the flood with some special rules and some special programs and it's had a lot of bumps in the road and some of the rules are not real clear so I'm kind of I've been working with several people in in Moortown and in Waterbury that were affected and it's just too confusing for me um, so I have to defer them to Efficiency Vermont and try and help them best I can I do find a lot of people are making decisions that are not necessarily the best in the long run, but they're forced to make decisions because they got to move forward. Um, so.
So I'm, I'm having problems with ef efficiency incentives right now with clients from Efficiency Vermont and how to get through them. So I, I can't really help much there. Thanks for the kid. Thank you. I did would like to add, uh, actually, another thought came to mind. Um, something that is really not mentioned that often as a funding mechanism for efficiency improvements, um, we have the low income weatherization. But there are people that have an income that's above the low income weatherization and may have a hard time affording to invest in this money. And we don't have pace yet. Maybe in the town of Waitsfield in the next several months, we might have the start of it. But um, each area of Vermont also has an organization that will do some low interest, if not no, int no interest loans. Um, in this area, it's Central Vermont Community Land Trust. Over in Addison County and Rutland County, it's um, Northern NeighborWorks of Northern Vermont. Um, so that's another funding avenue. And then, of course, there's also the local banks. Their programs are constantly changing, but the banks are starting to realize the value of energy efficiency improvements, and they're starting to offer a little better um, loan terms for energy efficiency improvements. So that's another, as Chris pointed out, funding for energy efficiency improvements is important. My question's for you guys. Um, I'm Liz from Community Action. I made this map, not me personally. I work with professionals since I can only draw stick figures. Um, and that's how I started it. I'm not looking for feedback tonight because it's overwhelming, but I would love feedback. Chris knows how to get to me, um, or it's L. Schlegel, which is impossible, but Chris knows how to spell it, um, at cvcac.org. And let me just tell you, we made this because telling people that it was easy was a lie. It's not easy, okay? You're going to do lots of work in your house. It will be as complicated in some cases as a kitchen renovation with lots of decisions and lots of pathways. And we felt like people were really, like, just hitting a brick wall when we were like, oh, this is easy. We'll come to your house. And so we decided we would be honest. You're the first audience who's ever gotten a copy of it, so I'm just going to be really interested in whether honesty, like, has any payback. Um, because it may be that the right answer is to say that it's easy. You know, we don't know. As um, Chris said, we don't have, like, a big answer. Nobody in the United States has a big answer on what it takes to get people to do the work they need to do to make their houses use less energy. You know, there is no magic bullet. Nobody, we're doing great, and we think we're doing terrible because it's not enough jobs. You know, we're not doing enough houses. And for us to meet our carbon goals and our economic goals in Vermont, we all have to heat using less kilowatts. You know, Richard's right. Like, we really have to drive down our own demand. And the way we do that on the heating side is we make our houses better. Like, that's the only way. And I, I wish I could tell you that people are knocking the doors down to take Efficiency Vermont up on their incentives, but they're not. Like, that's real life. Like, there's incentives out there. There's contractors out there. There's great contractors. People are not, like, you know, knocking the doors down to get this done. And we're looking for any ideas people have on how to help people move forward. You know, that includes all of you, all these people who are interested enough to show up here. You know, but this is a big, naughty problem. It's going to take all of us. So any feedback you have, I am more than ready for it. Thank you. I've got one question for um, actually Chris and maybe everybody in the audience. Isn't there some way to figure out uh, how much we're conserving? There's got to be a way because I think just from what you just said, um, we've got to somehow get people motivated to do the conservation efforts. And I think that's getting feedback, but how do we measure it? If anybody's got any ideas, we should get them out and start working on them. Maybe I can address this a little bit. Um, there, on the electric side, you know, as is mentioned, there's a lot of different opportunities for measuring it, and it may come from your meters, but it also comes from your utility bills. And the question is, is how is it easy to aggregate, say, a community's 
uh, level of energy consumption because on an individual level there's a lot of peaks and valleys and you know your consumption might change based on you know whether you have kids or you know where the kids are you know everything changes in your life but from a community you know when you look at energy consumption in the valley which Stan was involved in a couple of years back um, it's incredibly uniform from year to year you know and we have some big drivers on the commercial side obviously from the ski areas but on the residential side it's almost uniform it's amazing and so the question is you know how do you aggregate that data but then engage the community to act upon it you know and, and so I think that's really the question of the day is you know the engagement is you know okay we can develop a plan of attack you know what are the things you know week by week month by month that this is the tip of the day the tip of the week the tip of the month what should you be focusing on and and have people chisel away at things but when you look at it from a community perspective it actually makes a difference but that also includes meaning engaging the fuel dealers because then they need to share the information from a valley perspective in order to help inform that process I'm Nancy Notterman and energy coordinator for the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission for a few more weeks <laughs> till the funding runs out. But um, two things, uh, Waterbury Leap has just developed a, um, an indicator, a way you can evaluate your community and it includes, you know, heating, electricity, transportation. They're working out the details of this, but I think it's gonna be really useful for communities, especially for um, energy committees and municipalities. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to mention it as it, it's a good launch. It might be a good way to engage people. Um, and something, um, a newly formed energy committee in Barry Town, Barry City is working on. They are going to be putting articles in the paper about people who have done efficiency work and had energy, this is really hard, but the, um, energy audits. And because one of the other things that um, the High Meadows Foundation has been working on is how do you, just what Liz was talking about, how do you get people to do this work? And one thing that seems to be coming up is that uh, your peers, if you know your neighbor's done it and they talk about it, then that's a trusted source. And so the energy group in Barrie is going to be doing articles, whether it's every other week, every three weeks, um, about local people and what they've done, whether it's renewable or efficiency or whatever. So those are just some suggestions. And also I would say um, everybody should jump in and help Chris <laughs> as the energy coordinator. <laughs> and yes, I'm sorry, all of them. <laughs> because um, it can be extra work, yes, but you also learn a lot, and um, it also can be fun. So, thanks. Any other questions out there, Lindsay? I'm gonna take the initiative. Um, I want to uh, really thank all our presenters uh, for for engaging us in this dialogue. Um, this has been really useful. Um, thank you everyone who came out to participate um, and that are watching uh, in the comfort of their home. Um, we will, the, uh, the PowerPoint presentations uh, fr from this uh, evening will be up on the Mad River Valley Planning District website, which is MRVPD for Mad River Valley Planning District, MRVPD at madriver.com. Um, it is not only will the presentations from this event and a summary that Vicki Trahi um, will, will be putting together and will be up next week, uh, but we'll also have, we also have the summaries and presentations from all the other events uh, from the series. Um, but uh, I want to thank the community for, for engaging in this uh, dialogue through since September. Um, once a month uh, coming and, and participating in different parts of the, the energy question. Um, I'd like to think that we uh, have, have, have brought folks forward um, that, that are working on different aspects of the renewable energy and energy broad field uh, into the community and we're able to, to elevate the conversation 
uh, so, so that we have uh, the right tools to, to chart our future. Um, looks like Stan has a question before. It's not a question. I actually just wanted to recognize uh, Joshua Schwartz for the incredible work of putting this together. It's uh, five. Thanks, Stan. Uh, I don't know how. So five different series, three speakers per. That's 15 different um, speakers across you know, uh, four months. It's been really incredible. And, a model probably for a lot of other places to follow as well. Well, thank you. And I wouldn't be doing it right if I didn't thank the Mad River Valley Plain District Steering Committee and VCAN um, who are allowing me to do this. Um, so uh, but I want to encourage folks to come up here and take a look at um, of what we have. Um, thank you to Brad and uh, Lori. I believe both will be here to answer any additional questions. Um, there's some food in the back, and please uh, patronize the big picture. So thank you all and have a great evening.